Anianseo, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bertrand Brett, and I'm at the head of the International Affairs Department of Paris Habitat. Paris Habitat is a public social housing company linked to the City Hall of Paris. First of all, on behalf of my chief executive officer, Mr. Stéphane Dauphin, of my colleagues who are speaking, and of course, of my own, I would like to thank a lot and address our warmest greetings to our partners and friends of the Seoul Housing Communities Corporation and to the organizers for inviting us to participate to this so fantastic Public Housing International Conference. It is a great honor, but also a great pleasure too, for the six of us to share with all these distinguished speakers and attenders analysis and good professional practices. And we are more particularly happy to see that Seoul Housing, thanks to this conference, succeeds to create a professional link to build a bridge between Asia, New Zealand, and even European social housing providers, who many of them are yet good partners and friends of us, giving to all the participants the opportunity of inspiring and fruitful exchanges. We have decided with Mr. Dauphin that it will be these of our staff members who are directly involved in the management of the subjects we want to show you to present them to you. So, let them talk. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Stéphane Dauphin and I am the Chief uh, Executive Officer of uh, Paris Habitat. First of all, I would like to join my uh, warmest uh, greetings and also this of uh, Mrs. Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, who has been uh, informed of this international event. To our friend of Seoul Housing and to all the organizers of this conference for uh, inviting us uh, as uh, speakers. Here is the, the plan of my presentation. After a few words about social housing in France, in Paris, and about uh, Paris Habitat. My colleague Anna Fischer-Bohm will uh, explain to you why and how we consider our tenants as the best uh, experts of their uh, living environment. Social housing in France is an old story. It has been founded by a law adopted in the late 19th century. At the beginning, it was a, a tool of um, public health policy to fight um, the effect of a pandemic uh, in uh, Hernalsi district of cities and provide uh, a good and cheap condition of uh, living for the workers and their family. After the Second World War, it becomes one of the main ways for housing and urban development policies at a national level. So it means that from the beginning, and it's and it is still true uh, today, social housing in France is absolutely not only dedicated to the poorest or the homeless, but it's considered as the key tool for promoting social mix everywhere in the country. This is why it's compulsory for every French city to get at least 25% of social housing by 20 and 2025. There are now nearly more than 500 and, uh, social housing companies which are all non-profit companies in France. That means that each euro of profit uh, we earn must be reinvest in the, our social activity. Um, two main points, uh, the allocation and the founding system. Uh, a social flat is allocated according to three criteria the fact that you stay in France in a legal situation, the level of your uh, yearly income because there is a cap on your, and your social situation. In this slide, you can see uh, uh, the four categories of uh, social housing. The first uh, three ones are pure social housing. And according to the level of your yearly incomes, uh, the level of the rent is from 5 to 13 euros per square meter per month. And there is a, a fourth category uh, which is not considered as a social housing but that we can offer because it's a good support to host people 
from the middle and the upper middle class in cities like Paris, where the, the private market is very uh, expensive for many, uh, many people. Always um, the idea to guarantee social mix everywhere in the cities. As you can see, the founding system is very diversified and could seem a bit complicated, and it is. Um, in a way, it's simple. Public subsidies from states and cities, long-term loans from now 40 to 16, 60 years at the low rate provided by a public bank and the revenues uh, from the rents. The big challenge we have to deal with right now is that, that we receive less and less public subsidies and we must be more and more self funder so now let's move to the social housing policies in Paris. First of all, you must know that Paris is a small city, a very small city of only 105 square kilometers located in a region area of 12,000 square kilometers. So compared to Seoul, for example, it's a very, very small. But with, uh, as you can see, with uh, 2.3 million of uh, inhabitants in Paris, it's one of the most dense cities in the world with an average rate of uh, 21,000 inhabitants per square kilometer. Secondly, Paris is one of the most expensive cities in the world now. The average price for rental is 30 American dollars per square meter and more than 13,000 American dollars per square meter if you want to buy. So compared to the level of the social rent, you easily understand that there is a very, very long waiting list for getting a social flat. Third point, as you can see, social housing is not equally uh, located in Paris. Dark districts are these with more than 10,000 social flats. So as you can see, it's more in the, in, the east of, in the east of Paris and clear pink or white uh, with less than uh, 1,000. Another point is the fact that Paris is now built. So the only way to provide social, new social flats is either to densify a density or to transform or recycle existing tower block. In this slide, all the blue points are added floors to buildings done between the middle of the 19th century and the middle of the 20th, the 20th century. So, regarding this situation, here now is the, 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 the main housing goal in Paris. So providing a social mix everywhere in the city uh, is at the core of them. One more about uh, the climate plane. It's very ambitious. It's a very ambitious uh, plane for fighting the effect of the climate change. Paris Habitat is a strong partner of the city uh, of Paris, uh, and we are strongly engaged uh, beside the city of Paris uh, in their climate plane. For instance, by reducing the, the energy consumption and the greenhouse emission gas uh, in the city of 25% by 2025 or by becoming a zero carbon uh, city by 2050. To do so, the city hall of Paris uses some very strong and efficient tools. The most uh, significant are presented in this slide and the two first are the most efficient. For inst instance, uh, pu put compulsory that in districts where is, the, where is a lack of social housing, every new private building to be done must account for 30% 30, so 30 of social housing. Or, um, that the French law devolutes to Meyer the right to buy first as a simple dwelling, as a whole tower block, but on the market to be sold with a negotiated price. A last word to pay your attention on the new 
political wish uh, of our mayor to give to Paris a new bioclimatic plan by 2023. And now a brief presentation of Paris Habitat to conclude my talk. Uh, with more than uh, 125,000 social flats, uh, Paris Habitat is the main social housing actor in the city. We house one Parisian on nine. We also, uh, we also are a urban planner and we manage more than 4,000 amenities and shops. That means uh, that our tower blocks as, are as well a place to live for household, but also a place for social, business, commercial and cultural activities. We not only uh, build social flats, we also provide the public equipment for the municipality as school, daily nursery, gymnasium, public library and, or social residence for students or care centers, for example. So we have a, a global approach of, our, um, of uh, what we do in the, in the city. And this slide shows you how diversified is our real estate, mixing uh, old Osmanian uh, traditional building to new modern construction. Just to underline that nearly 40% of um, how real estate has been built before the Second World War, inducing us to promote an ambitious renewal plan uh, actually. Last point to conclude my talk, uh, our dialogue policy with our tenants, uh, which is that uh, the core of um, our activities. In a few years uh, ago, and it's not so far, we did our cultural revolution in this matter. From now on, tenants are clients, stakeholders, policy makers, and we try to recognize them as citizens uh, in their own rights. My colleague uh, Hanna is going to present you what does it concretely means through two examples. But I would like um, to share uh, with uh, you some examples of uh, our new services, services that we provide to our tenants and which all of them have been discussed and approved before by their representatives in a dedicated tenants Council. In this time of uh, pandemia of COVID, the, the, the fact that we offer uh, for less than two American dollars per month what we call a social tribal play, including providing television networks, uh, phone and internet, help us uh, as a lot to fight the effect of an isolation and to contact them more easily. So thank you uh, very much uh, for your attention. And uh, now I give the, the floor to Hannah Fisherbaum. And of course, uh, I hope to see you soon everywhere, maybe in Asia, maybe in Paris, and have a, a very good conference. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hannah Fisherbaum, and I work in the 20th arrondissement and the 12th arrondissement at Paris Habitat. I wanted to talk to you today about how we go a little bit further in some of our outreach with our residents. Um, it's a process of dialogue where we try to treat residents as experts. The idea is that residents have their own often overlooked expertise, which is based on their lived experience. And when you can harness this, it can be a very powerful tool in adapting housing better to their needs. On the other hand, it also requires very specific, tailor-made participatory tools. When we're adapting these, I like to think of the words of one of my most, uh, one of my favorite people, Jane Jacobs, who said that cities have the cap capability of providing something for everyone only because and only when they are created by everyone. And we're just gonna make a little modification in that and say, Housing has the capability of providing something for everyone, 
when they are created by everybody. So I want to tell you about two examples. The first example is in the 20th arrondissement at the edge of Paris. This is an example on the scale of a neighborhood because it's 3,000 housing units, 7,000 people. It's an area that's characterized with lower incomes and higher unemployment, and we're working together with the city of Paris on a number of projects. What we wanted in this neighborhood is for people, for the residents of the neighborhood, to be real stakeholders in the, in the common spaces that they all share. And in order to do that, we followed the process of placemaking, which is a methodology that is often used in North America to, uh, to enliven spaces. It happens in several steps. The first step is outreach. So you use different methods of outreach, but you have to adapt them to residents. Maybe the residents won't come to public meetings. So what do you do? You have a block party. Maybe they're not going to fill out surveys. So what do you do? You have a workshop. Or you just sit at the ed edge of the building and you let people come and tell you what they want to tell you about their neighborhood and about their housing. We encourage residents to share their ideas about their existing outside spaces, and we encourage them to share their thoughts about future designs. The third step is one of my favorites. It's the step of experimentation. We take some of the propositions and we test them for a short period. And this allows our residents to have more informed opinions. Uh, it, it also helps people, if they had some doubts, to get over their reticence and see that something that maybe they weren't really on board with, that they were opposed to, can actually work. Because a short-term short commitment can be easier to undertake. And it also helps people to come together and build partnerships to be able to manage these things together. Another word for this phase can be called tactical urbanism. And it's something that happens in a lot of cities around the world. At the same time, a second, also very important goal of this process is to identify and accompany groups of residents who want to become actors in their community, either by volunteering in a community garden, simply organizing a meal with their neighbors, creating a tenants association, or even taking over some of the management of their own residences themselves. So on this slide, you can see a couple of pictures of these places, of these uh, propositions. You can see um, one of my very favorites in the bottom corner, which is children playing. Children playing seems like not a very big deal, but for some residents, it's kind of a little bit controversial because it means noise and because it can mean something that can get a little out of control. So what did we do? We tested it. We had children, uh, we had a, a, a nonprofit association come in for a couple of hours on Wednesday afternoon when the children are not in school, and they, uh, they had a playtime. And that way we showed the residents and we tested and we tried to push a little bit the boundaries. Another photo that I wanted to point out is the second to the top, where you can see that there's a group of women around a table eating, drinking, and participating in, uh, in this process by sharing their ideas. And I think that image reflects how when you change the forum a little bit, you can often get different input. The second example is a much smaller example, but it's, uh, it concerns housing that is going to be built. And it's an outreach process that we carried out with future residents of a building that's going to be built on the Saint Vincent de Paul Hospital in the 14th arrondissement in Paris. What we did is we took a panel of 20 future residents, we took the architects, and we took the housing company, and we got them to work together to conceive the future housing, and also to conceive a system of shared management. In order to do this, it was really important to set some ground rules. And that's this framework for participation. This allowed everyone to be in their right place. 
One of the things that's very interesting, I think, about this process is that it defines when the future residents are informed, when they are decision makers, and when we are counting on them as actors after construction to really bring a project forward. And so what you can see here is a graphic that shows in the housing where the residents are positioned on what issues. So for example, on environmental goals, the last goal, you can see that we're really counting on this panel of 20 residents to help us bring to term the environmental goals of the building after construction. In order to, to do this outreach, there was an intense period of, of workshopping between June and October in 2020. We did have to adapt it a little bit because there was COVID, <laughs> so it wasn't exactly how we had anticipated, but it really relied on a lot of different events. Some of them were just informal events that allowed to build the group dynamic, fun events. Others were workshops to take on the, the group's government, governance and the rules of the, of the workshops. And the last point was really to define the architectural program elements in the common spaces and in the apartments. So here are two examples. The first example is how do you sequence between the private and the public spheres? What happens between when you walk into your courtyard and you walk into your, the door of your house? And you can see in the photos some examples of things that they proposed to the residents, so some things that were proposed to the residents um, that, were, that can be really right up against the houses. A second example is how to use the central courtyard. A central courtyard, at least in France, can also often be a place where there's a lot of conflict. People have very different ideas of how to use a central courtyard. The residents looked at, at, looked at the plans and they made their own propositions. They said, we need to be able to move in the court, courtyard. And so the architects integrated a system of stone pavers so that they can move more fluidly in the courtyard. And the last set of questions I think are really important to a housing company like us. They also asked, the residents made points about who was going to access the courtyard and when. Can you access it at night? There are common spaces. Who goes there? How are, there, how are they governed? And those questions, they have started to be answered, but they will continue to be answered even after the project is constructed. And so those, so this project is a project on a very small scale that really means to reflect the way that future residents want to live. We continue to experiment on new ways to reach out to our residents and we hope to come back to you later with some other new ideas.